Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this evening's uh, from Call Memorial Lecture, uh, co-sponsored by the Ukrainian Canadian Professional Business Association of Ottawa, as well as the Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Ottawa. Uh, it is um, a very difficult time for all of us, of course, with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but today's uh, lecture, I think, will be very interesting for many of us, or for all of us. And I, I thank the Chair, uh, Professor Dominique Orell, and our speaker, Olesa Homechuk, for speaking this evening. Uh, and with that, I will uh, hand it off to the Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Ottawa, Professor Dominique Orell. Thank you, Kassian. Uh, just want to make sure that people have logged on. Okay. Um, yes, it is uh, under the most uh, dire circumstances. It is still nonetheless a great pleasure uh, to, uh, to host uh, Dr. Olesya Khromeychuk, who is the director of the Ukrainian Institute in London and also uh, teaches at the uh, University of Cambridge. And she taught in a number of British uh, universities. Uh, she has a PhD in history um, with a great thesis on the memory of uh, the Galicia division in uh, Western Ukraine. That's at the time where we met, I suppose about 10 years ago, and we were both involved in the civic initiative here in Canada, um, the Ukrainian Jewish uh, encounter. Um, but uh, for Lesia, has a new book, um, very poignant book on uh, the loss of her brother in the Donbass war. Um, and originally the intent was to have uh, Olesia as our Franco lecture speaker, um, to turn that into like a book panel to talk about the book. That was the intent a couple of months ago when she was invited. And of course we have the war right now. So Olesia will seek to do both, to talk about the war while talking about the book, or how the book inspires her to talk about the war and understand the great calamity that Ukraine has been experiencing for three weeks. Um, I want also to introduce uh, our PhD student at, um, at the Chair of Ukrainian Studies and in the School of Political Study, Z Anastasia Lewilin, who will assist me in, in the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Khramechuk will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll ask Anastasia and I will have a couple of questions and then we'll open it to the floor, the virtual floor. So I um, invite people in the audience to use the Q&A option because we uh, only us and um, the organizers will be able to use the chat as kind of for security reasons. Um, uh, but by all means, ask your questions at any time uh, during the speech, uh, during the talk uh, or during the Q&A and we'll select as many uh, as possible. Um, unfortunately, uh, because of the uncertain situation, the war, and then we had Zelensky speaking to the Canadian Parliament yesterday, to US Congress today. Um, I've been asked to, uh, to go back to a movie, uh, not a movie studio, I wish, <laughs> but a TV studio. So I'm um, to talk about Ukraine, of course. Um, so I'm gonna have to leave at six, uh, but Anastasia will take care of the re remaining um, the segment of the Q&A, which I'm sure will have a vibrant discussion. So without further ado, Alessia, you have the floor. Minix, thank you so much. And thank you for being such a wonderful friend and colleague for over a decade now. Thanks for reminding me how long it's been. Um, I really value that. It's my very great honor to deliver the 36th annual Ivan Franco Memorial Lecture. And I am really grateful to the Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Ottawa and the Ukrainian Canadian Professional and Business Association Ottawa chapter for inviting me to deliver this lecture. It is a particular honor to speak about Ukraine to this distinguished audience today. Um, at a time when Ukraine is living through the darkest moment in its history since the restoration of independence. While my heart breaks every minute 
with the news of every lost life, of every destroyed city and town, and every individual who is forced to leave his or her home. I am proud of being Ukrainian today like never before. The country's defiance, its people's courage, the choice of freedom over fear is an example for the world to follow. Rather than giving a talk on my book, as Dominique mentioned, or on part of my research, I decided to share today with you some of my observations of the last three weeks um, since Russia started a full-scale um, war against Ukraine. Um, I am sure that, like me, most of you have not had the chance to process uh, this new phase of war. Uh, its consequences are likely to affect generations, not only in Ukraine, but in Russia and in Europe and all over the world. Reflecting on this will take some time and some emotional distance. So what I'm going to offer to you today is rather raw, but perhaps such raw reflections can serve as record of how we feel, feel in the middle of it all, um, before peacetime allows us to think of this war with more clarity. So these thoughts um, are inspired to some degree by my experience of writing A Loss, my recent book that Dominique mentioned. I couldn't have written them while I was experiencing my grief most acutely. But in my darkest moments, I made notes um, and I recorded fragmented reflections. And it is on those reflections that I based my book later on. So let me begin. On the 24th of March, 2017, my life was turned upside down. At around 6 p.m. Kyiv time, a piece of shrapnel ended my brother's life. It happened in Luhansk region, 2,000 miles away from London. A couple of hours later, around 6 p.m. London time, I was standing on Trafalgar Square waiting for a friend from Kyiv to take him for a drink. He was on a brief visit in the UK. It was Friday night, the pubs were busy, but London felt uneasy. We had just experienced a terrorist attack two days prior, which resulted in six deaths as a man drove his car into pedestrians on Westminster Bridge. When we met, I asked my friend if he was okay. A terrorist attack is not the best way to welcome a visitor. He said he was fine. He said he didn't feel much these days. One of his jobs in Kyiv was translating Ukrainian news stories into English. When you spend days translating texts about war casualties, you get used to it, he told me. We had our drink, talked about Ukraine, mostly about cinema, his specialty. He gave me tips on which of the numerous new films not to miss and which not to waste my time on. I went home and I thought I must phone my brother tomorrow. I had spent the whole of Friday with my phone in my hand, planning to ring him and see how he was getting on at the front but something kept getting in the way. Speaking to my friend from Kyiv made me really want to hear my brother's voice. I'll call him tomorrow, I said to myself before going to sleep. But there was no tomorrow, at least not for my brother. Around 5 p.m. Kyiv time on Friday, 24th of March, my brother Volodya was killed by shrapnel in Luhansk region, 2,000 miles away from London. I didn't know it at the time. I learned the following day, the day on which I planned to call him and ask him how he was getting on at the front. In the last phone call he made, I know this from talking to his friend, he was planning his leave, which was meant to start in a couple of days. The planning was interrupted by blasts and my brother's cry, suka, bled, meaning something like shit, fuck in English. And then the line went dead. In one of my last conversations, phone conversations with Volodya, I asked him when his leave was coming up. Sometime in the spring, he said, adding, if I live. Don't, don't say that, of course you live. I said the obvious thing one says in a situation like this, even if one has no confidence in one's words. You don't get it, Mala, do you? Responded my brother. He liked to remind me that I was his little Mala sister. He told me that the way he saw it, the war in Donbass, was just a start of a much larger war, a European war. You're smart, you're a historian, but you don't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't want to get it. 
On the 24th of February, 2022, five years less one month since my brother's death, my life was turned upside down again. At 5 a.m. Kyiv time, Putin's army began a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. It was 3 a.m. in London, and I was still working on an article I promised to submit to a London paper, but got delayed with the text because I had been at a protest outside of the Russian embassy. I finished the draft and I was about to go to bed. But in my anxious state, we had all been waiting for something to happen. I thought I'd check my Twitter feed one last time. The feed was filled with tweets starting with a lightning symbol. They were reporting explosions. It started, tweeted people who were based in Ukraine. In a video clip, a CNN correspondent, one of a small army of foreign reporters sent to Ukraine in anticipation of the invasion, looked visibly shaken. I tell you what, I just heard a big bang right behind me, he said live on TV. Immediately behind him was the beautiful bell tower of Kyiv St. Sophia. The explosion was still some distance away. My hands shaking, I dialed the number of my closest friend who had left London a couple of weeks earlier. She had said that she couldn't sit and doom scroll in her London home and went back to Ukraine. I woke her and told her that the war had begun, again. This time, the sort of war my brother had warned me about. The sort he could see from the trenches, but I refused to see from the comfort of my still peaceful life. I sat in front of my laptop, watching the invasion unfold in front of my eyes, quite literally. Videos depicting blasts appeared one after another. Professional correspondence reports were mixed among ordinary Kievans' footage from their windows. Suka, Vlad, were among the most common words in these amateur reports of a brutal aggression. Three weeks on, the West in the West, we continue to watch Russian troops shell hospitals, kindergartens, schools, universities on our TV and laptop screens. As we observe civilians, including some of our academic colleagues, flee into safety and others take up arms or resist in other ways, as we get the news of students getting killed either in attacks or on uh, in, in attacks on residential areas or at the front line, I can't help but wonder how we got here, how the ground was prepared for this attack, what we could have done to prevent it. And even more importantly, I keep thinking what we can do now and in the future. Putin has one of the largest armies in the world, but he has other weapons too. Culture and history take a prominent place in his arsenal. And if the missiles are directed at the Ukrainian people, weaponized culture and history have been effectively targeting us in the West for some time. For example, every trip to a gallery or museum in London with exhibits on art or cinema from the USSR reveals deliberate or just lazy misinterpretation of the region as one endless Russia much like the current president of the Russian Federation would actually like to see it. The curators have no problem presenting Jewish, Belarusian, or Ukrainian art and artists as Russian. On the rare occasion when a Ukrainian is not presented as Russian, he or she might be presented as Ukraine, Ukrainian born, as was the case with the film director Alexander Dovzhenko in one of the major exhibitions on revolutionary art in London. Another problem is the Second World War. Whether in popular television programs or history books um, on university syllabi, journalists and authors continue to speak of the Russians who defeated Hitler on the Eastern Front and the Russians who suffered from Nazi occupation. One quick look at the map depicting wartime Europe is enough to see that no more than 5% of Soviet Russia was occupied by the Nazis. That is not to diminish the suffering of the Russians in World War II, which was undoubtedly great. This is to remember that the entirety of Ukraine and Belarus were occupied. The very countries that Russia terrorizes today and claims as part of its sphere of influence. The phrase sphere of influence was bounced around in the media prior to Russia's full-scale attack on Ukraine. And there were plenty of commentators who made no connection to the ghost of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact that had already split Europe into spheres of influence once before. The list of similar examples can go on. 
Many Ukraine experts have spent their careers pointing out the ubiquitous basic errors about Ukraine in academic discourse and popular imagination, risking being perceived much like an angry woman who constantly criticizes patriarchy in a room full of men who don't understand what her problem is. Misreading Ukraine and misunderstanding Russia is a choice. Educating ourselves, checking our knowledge of that part of the world and correcting our prejudices implies further action. It would mean that we would have to speak up against the Russian-centric view of Eastern Europe, a view that is uncritical of Russia's neo-imperialism. It would mean not only writing critical reviews of inadequately curated exhibitions on Russian avant-garde or the Russian revolution, it would also mean changing reading lists, teaching cur curricula, expanding Russian and Eurasian centers to actually include the study of the region beyond Russia in a meaningful way and to seek funding for this. It would mean establishing connections with Ukrainian universities, dealing with bureaucratic, humiliating, and costly visa applications for scholars and students. When Russia occupied Crimea, the disapproval of Putin's disregard for international law was softened by the question, but wasn't Crimea sort of Russian anyway? This betrayed a profound misunderstanding, not only of Ukrainian history, but that of the Crimean Tatars. It meant choosing not to see that the Crimean Tatars who had been deported by Stalin in 1944 had also been being persecuted by Putin since 2014. It meant choosing not to see the link between the two attacks on the indigenous population of the peninsula. When Russia attacked Donbass, initial indignation was quickly lessened by the question, but they are all Russian speakers there, aren't they? It took the shelling of civilians for the world to realize that the Russian world, where Russian speakers have been protected by Putin, actually looks like Kharkiv, destroyed by Russian missiles. It took the attack on Russophone Ukrainians to hear the voice, a voice in Russian telling a military Russian ship, the Russian troops, and the Russian president where to go. A failure to grasp Ukrainian bilingualism was particularly evident in monolingual cultures throughout the world, despite the fact that Putin's equation of Russians and Russian speakers is as absurd as suggesting that the Irish, the Australians, or indeed the Canadians are basically English because they can all speak English. Or that the Austrians and Germans are basically German, but let's not make that parallel because it's poor taste, isn't it? And when the Russians used the terminology of the Second World War to define the imperialist attack on Ukraine and labeled Ukrainians fascists, there were voices who said, but don't they have the far right in Ukraine? A quick Google search will tell you that in 2019 elections, the nationalist parties collectively received just over 2% of the vote, well below the 5% threshold required to take seats in parliament. It took days of brutal shelling, including of Babanyar, the site of massacre of Kyiv's Jews by the Nazis, and hundreds of mentions of Volodymyr Zelensky's Jewish roots and the fact that some of his family perished in the Shoah for Putin's denazification rhetoric to be widely discredited. When back in July 2021, Putin wrote his 5,000 word declaration of war, denying Ukrainian statehood, the essay inspired many analysts to start asking whether indeed there, were, there was any difference between Ukrainians and Russians. Six months later, when Putin reinforced his words with missiles and tanks, the question is still being asked. Since the 24th of February, my phone has barely stopped ringing. Journalists from local radio stations and top international broadsheets alike ask for commentary. The question of how exactly Ukrainians are different from Russians um, pops up at some point in the conversation. One reporter suggested that the war is complicated to grasp because Slavs are killing Slavs. Another began his interview by asking me, so are you Ukrainian or Russian? Which are you? My responses evolved from patiently taking them through the history of Ukraine from Kiev and Rus to the present day, to telling them that they have little chance of understanding Ukraine or Russia for that matter, if they are forever stuck in the framework laid out for them by Putin. In 2014, the world quickly descended into Ukraine fatigue, failing to understand that that too prepared fertile ground for Russia's 
uh, continued aggression. Are we becoming better educated about Ukraine now? Perhaps, but it's certainly happening at a very high price. Is the knowledge of the region we are acquiring sufficient not to deal with this crisis, not only to deal with this crisis at hand, but also with its lasting consequences? Possibly not. The widespread celebration of Ukrainian defiance without understanding its origins reinforces ignorance. The roots of this defiance go far back into history of living next to an aggressive imperialist state that has repeatedly denied subjectivity of the peoples living within or around it. It is also grounded in the ex experience of Russian occupation of Crimea and Donbass since 2014, a regime that turns art centers into concentration camps, kidnaps civilians and imprisons them on fabricated charges, and does all this in the name of some phantom Russian greatness will not be tolerated in Ukraine. Watching the entire society putting up resistance fills me with pride, but it's also heartbreaking. Every civilian who is forced to take up arms, every teenager who learns how to make Molotov cocktails, every grandmother who stands in front of a Russian tank with nothing but a Ukrainian flag is a citizen in despair. Ukrainians act this way because they know that no one will come to their rescue. They act this way because they have too much to lose. Not only their homes, not only their freedom, not only their lives. They fight for the right to have a future, to be able to choose that future for themselves. The anniversary of my brother's death is coming up. It will mark five years since he was killed in a war started by the Russians in 2014. That war took 14,000 lives. It will mark a month since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion that is claiming hundreds of lives today. When I light a candle in Volodya's memory, I will tell him that I'm smarter now, that I get it. But I won't speak for the whole world. It's too early for that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Olesya. Normally, there would be applauding, but we're virtual, so I, I know that everyone is applauding. That was very moving. Um, you, um, you came to the West as a teenager, as I recall. Your parents moved from uh, Western Ukraine. Was it Tarnopil, Ivano Frankivsk? And... Lviv. 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 Ah, well, I was inching towards. <laughs> uh, I had the region correct. Yes. Uh, Galicia, I guess it was my my student who was from Ternopil, who is from Ternopil. Um, so your brother also then grew up in the West. Uh, my brother didn't move with us, but my brother, sorry to interrupt you, Dominique, my, but my brother also left as a young man and he lived in uh, the Netherlands for 11 years. Okay. So what impelled him to, he basically, he was like a, a diaspora Ukrainian and, and uh, but, no one forced him to, to join the, uh, the armed forces and go and fight in Donbass. What impelled him to, to volunteer? It's a good question. Um, I don't know if he would have identified himself as a uh, diaspora. I, I've struggled to uh, use that identification for myself until recently. I think I finally accepted that I am part of the diaspora. <laughs> The, the most recent wave, I guess, or not the most recent, we're going to have another wave now. Um, but he was definitely an immigrant. Um, so anybody who's had any experience of immigration will know that being an immigrant is not fun. Um, and I think he just got really tired of living in the Netherlands and always being a foreigner. He experienced quite a lot of xenophobia when he was there. He shared some of that with me. Uh, yeah, and he absolutely adored Lviv. He really, really liked Lviv. He wanted to live there, so he just went back. He went back in 2010, so he didn't go back to fight. Uh, I talk in my book that the obituaries after his death presented his move to Ukraine as, you know, they made that connection. I don't think it was deliberate, but, you know, they knew that he came back from the West. They knew that he volunteered to fight at the front. So they filled in the gap <laughs> and they presented that, look, a guy from Western Europe, in comfortable life, you know, left all of that behind and went to fight because that kind of heroic narrative uh, seemed like 
the right sort of narrative for their obituaries. And I talk about it at length uh, in my book. Why did he why did he volunteer? I don't know. I never got that answer out of him, but I think it's basically the same sort of feeling he experienced then as a lot of us are experiencing today. It's watching the destruction, it's watching um, it's watching uh, an attack on you know people who never asked to be rescued with uh, missiles, um, with violence. And also watching young people much younger than him, men and women return injured or dead. Um, yeah, and he decided that it was the right thing for him to do to go to to fight. He was not a military man. He had served as a conscript as a young man in the 90s, um, but never planned any career in the military or anything like that. He was an artist. He definitely wasn't. Um, you know, he wasn't a, an army person, but he, he made that choice and, and he stuck by it because he was demobilized um, after a year and a half of service or so. And he went right back, straight back. He, he went straight back and he lasted another three months and, and that's when he was killed in action. So he served for nearly two years. Nastasia? Uh, well, thank you very much for this great presentation. I have so many questions, like I'm sure everyone does. And so just a reminder right away uh, to attendees that you can uh, type up your questions in the Q&A function. Um, you can you know, feel free to get started right away. Um, you, um, well, you touched on it um, a bit by going into the history of Ukraine and Russia and the, the very complicated history between the two. Um, but perhaps you can address a bit the, the relationship be between Ukrainians and Russians moving forward. Um, I mean, obviously, we can see how it is at a state level that it's totally deteriorated. Um, but what do you think that um, the war means for uh, the people, especially the people in the, in the border areas who have um, longstanding relationships? Um, and uh, well, I could I could turn that into three questions in one, so I'll stop there. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. It's a really good question. I wish I had an answer to it, and I felt like I sort of had an answer to it before this uh, full scale invasion. And my answer was there has to be justice before this reconciliation, before people can come together and begin to talk to each other. We have to see justice. Oh, we have to see war criminals punished. But that was before, uh, bef before Putin attacked uh, the entire Ukraine. Um, I don't know how to answer that question anymore. I still, my view is still that uh, absolutely we have to see war criminals punished. We have to see Putin punished. But will people be able to restore relationship? See, a man who claimed that we are the same nation has done everything in his power to make sure that he separates us for generations. Um, too much suffering, too much blood has been shed to even imagine that people will have the emotional strength to think of rebuilding some kind of relationship with the Russians. Um, Let's see, let's see uh, first how uh, the punishment goes and how justice is done. And then maybe we'll start thinking about how we can build some kind of bridges over absolutely destroyed cities. You, um, so you went to the trauma of, of losing your, your older brother, but I would assume you, you have family still in, in Palachina. Um, yeah, I have family all over Ukraine, not just, I mean, most of my family is in Western Ukraine. My father is from the Carpathians, so a lot of them are there, a lot, a lot are around Lviv, but uh, I have family all over Ukraine. My father has a lot of siblings, so lots of cousins. We hear of their uh, terrible escape routes from um, partially occupied parts of Ukraine. Um, and I agree with this uh, phrase that's been uh, heard a lot over the last few days, that the family now consists of 44 million people. I mean, it is true. 
Sorry, you had a question, Dominique, and I interrupted you. <laughs> well, the question is, obviously, you've been in touch with your family, and, and uh, that must be extremely, on a personal level, extremely hard. Yeah, family and friends, and just seeing, gosh, seeing friends, you know, with whom we were planning uh, conferences or whatever, either trying to find safety, leaving leaving the country or or dropping off their children and coming back and seeing my um, male friends joining territorial defense um, mostly is men but all, a lot of women as well I mean as you probably know Dominique I've researched um, participation of women in the war in Donbass and I see a lot of those veterans now taking a very very women veterans are taking a very active role in going back to fight and one of them was killed uh, defending Kiev already. It's uh, it's it's heartbreaking. Anastasia. Oh well, I'm I I I mean it's I just what you're talking about is so is so compelling and and emotional. I'm not I'm not sure where to start with the next question. Um, Especially, uh, I, I also I, I I sort of feel bad for asking my first question because I, I realize it must be it must be difficult um, already, uh, given that you lost your your brother. Um, I guess um, I think the theme that I uh, uh, that really sticks with me was was the history and the context and um, how little. Uh, especially we in the West are aware of uh, the history of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people um, as very much a separate entity uh, than the Russians. Um, and so I suppose um, we were also talking about, you know, how people are surprised about this war. And I, I liked what you said, that you didn't get it, you didn't want to get it. And of course, there's um, of course, there's wishful thinking. You you never want to expect something like that. But um, do you think that if um, people outside of Ukraine and Russia were better informed, do we do you think that maybe um, other states or through you know di diplomatic channels might have been able to intervene? Um, before this turned into an outright war? I feel like there's several questions in that one question, but maybe I'll just try and, try and be brief. I, I genuinely think that as, as much as this being some kind of, you know, imperial, neo-imperialist attack on Ukraine and also on Europe, let's face it, it's um, Putin's not hiding his uh, uh, lack of love for Europe and the West more generally. Um, it's also a response to the inaction of the West in 2014. Um, I mean, this is what I've been sort of trying to say in my talk as well. The fact that we expressed our deep concern in 2014 when Crimea was illegally occupied um, and then moved on, you know, mattered. The fact that the war in Donbass kept claiming lives daily, basically. But when my brother died, I wrote a place uh, sort of a, six months, a year after his death. And we started to perform that play. It was a documentary play based on my experience and some of his videos and other documents that I found. Um, and we performed it to British audiences in the UK. And the response was, oh my God, this is terrifying. I didn't realize the war was still ongoing. So in 2017, people thought it was finished. Nobody, well, I talked about this Ukraine fatigue, right? We didn't pay attention to the fact that not only were lives being lost at the front line, people in occupied territories were suffering so much. I mean, now we have books like Stanislav Asseyev's about isolation, the concentration camp uh, in Donetsk, where people are, are still being tortured. Um, held illegally. These are civilians mostly. Um, we just didn't pay attention. We, and because we didn't pay attention, because there went consequences, and it was sort of, I mean, I've heard this phrase in 
discussions in the UK, a done deal, you know, Crimea referred to as a done deal. Um, he, why wouldn't he go further? We sort of gave him the green light. And I say we as the international community, each on our own level, whether that's by not wishing to educate ourselves more generally about history, that Ukrainians are uh, a different nation, that they are, I mean, for 30 years we've, we've had statehood, um, but somehow that, you know, that can be canceled by um, uh, Putin who claims that we don't have statehood, you know? So whether that's by not wishing to educate ourselves about history, about the state of affairs in Ukraine, or simply not intervening enough uh, and not responding to the already existing Russian aggression. Again, when my brother was killed in 2017, um, the Russians pretended they were not there. And we pretended that we believed them. Um, all of this has consequences, the consequences we are watching now. I don't know if I really answered your question. <laughs> I want to uh, apologize for the audience and to Alessia. Uh, we had a technical problem and the chat had not been deactivated. And we have a comment in the chat that uh, I invite everyone to disregard entirely. Uh, this is precisely why we didn't want to use uh, an open chat, but sometimes technical problems happen. So I invite everyone to use the Q&A and there's already a number of questions here. So I'll take one by Bogdan Kordan, a good friend from the uh, University of Saskatoon. And it's not an easy one, Olesia. <laughs> Do you see the conflict as the beginning of a new public and academic conversation regarding Ukraine and Russia? And what shape might this conversation take? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that conversation is already happening, I think, right? Finally, I mean, this is what I think. I think it's eight years too late, at least eight years. I would say it's 38 years too late. Um, well, not 38 years, sorry, 30 years too late uh, since the, the, you know, the re restoration of Ukrainian independence. It is happening. It's a good question. I think what needs to be part of that conversation is what I hinted at in my um in my talk, and that's building lasting uh, relationships, building, uh, creating lasting change. It's great to see academic community respond actually very quickly. It, I'm not speaking for the North American community so much. I wasn't able to pay attention uh, as much as I did um, in Europe and in the UK, but but I'm sure that it's even the response is even greater in North America because you have more centers for Ukrainian studies there. But even in the countries where there are very few uh, places where you can study Ukraine, um, the response was really uh, heartwarming. A lot of academics will started to look for funding for emergency scholarships um, for Ukrainian scholars and students. It wasn't always easy to persuade the management that uh, it seemed like a lot of this funding was grassroots funding as opposed to you know immediately coming from. Uh, the management, but it seems like that conversation is happening. What I really want to see is that that turns into lasting consequences, that we establish centers where Ukraine can be studied, um, that we create uh, relationships with Ukrainian universities, that we have exchanges, um, that um, the panels on Ukraine have Ukraine experts. And that those Ukraine experts are in-house experts, because this is another thing that I noticed over the last three weeks. I, I received uh, so many invitations to join academic panels. I ref uh, had to turn down most of them because I simply wasn't, I was not managing to find the time for it. But a lot of them went ahead with no Ukraine experts because they were simply hard to find. And... Uh, those who did have Ukraine experts were usually not from those centers which organized the discussion, which meant that they don't have in-house expertise. So this is the kind of dialogue we need to think about, and that's a dialogue of the Western institutions with Ukraine. And another dialogue, which is a difficult one, is to think how we respond to our existing relationship with Russia. Uh, and I know that's a controversial discussion and we need to have it openly. Um, a couple of things I'd just like to point out here is that in my view, it's unsafe 
to send students, for instance, to Russia uh, on exchange programs right now is something that we need to think about whether we um, want to send them to such a hostile place. And another thing, when we think whether we can continue cooperating with certain institutions in Russia, I mean, it's my view that we should not, um, but let's uh, look at what those institutions have done for the last eight years, not to mention the last three weeks. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you already know of the infamous um, letter of 184, whatever the number is now, rectors of top Russian institutions that endorsed Putin's war. I can share um, an anecdote, a very sad anecdote from my own life from 2016. My brother was already at the front and I was supposed to go and do research in Russia because a third of my, one of my case studies, one of three case studies was meant to be on Russia. And I was warned uh, by friends um, not to go. They basically said to me, it's not safe for me to go. I wrote to a university that was supposed to be inviting me to come. Uh, one of the best known universities in Russia, very, very respected, at least until recently in the West. And they, and I said, I'd give my reasons. I said, it, I'm being told it's unsafe for me to go. And their response was, well, um, you'd probably be fine unless you support Ukrainian state's activity in Donbass. Uh, but then if you did do that publicly, you wouldn't be able to cross the border anyway, uh, more or less verbatim. So if I publicly defend my brother's existence, <laughs> Uh, fighting in the Ukrainian armed forces, if I publicly recognize Ukrainian territorial defense, uh, Ukrainian territorial integrity and defense of that integrity, then as far as they can see, it would be justified if I got into trouble. That was back in 2016. Um, and things only got worse since then. So yeah, I would urge us to rethink our existing relationships and begin to think how we can build lasting bridges with Ukraine. We'll need it. Ukrainian scholars will be all over the world now. And um, they come with such wealth of knowledge, knowledge that is badly needed uh, in the West. Sorry, that was a very long rant, <laughs> but something I feel very strongly about, obviously, as you can imagine. Thank you. Uh, we have a question now from Frank Sisson. Uh, you've spent your career in Great Britain, where I assume most people assume the Scots are not English, even though the Scots do not have an independent state. Why do you think Britain is especially resistant to recognizing Ukrainians as a nation in contrast to the US and Canada? Are Britain's especially resistance to recognizing Ukrainians as a nation? I, I, I don't think they are, to be honest. I, I, maybe I misunderstand you, Frank, but I mean, I, I don't think they, um, they don't recognize Ukrainians as a nation. I think they have a profound lack of knowledge of what Ukraine is, because they never had to have that knowledge, um, partly for that reason. But I think partly also I have an explanation for that from my own research of the Second World War. And I studied, I studied the... Um, the post-war history of the waffen SS Galicia division, which ended up in Britain, um, at least for some, the members of which ended up here, at least for some period of time, and then they uh, moved on, they, a lot of them came to Canada. Um, and that made me understand that there was just complete uh, lack of understanding of anything other than other imperial centers, Moscow. Uh, so, um, you know, Ukrainians were just some this strange group of people, they sing, they have some language that is sort of like Russian, but isn't, you know, it's like total misunderstanding. That was a long time ago, uh, but I, I think I see some of that echo today. It's, you know, one imperial center understanding another imperial center, um, even though those empires don't exist anymore. And that's, again, that has to change. Um, and maybe, maybe Ukrainians are better understood in Edinburgh <laughs> than they are in London. Um, but yeah. <laughs> we have a question from Bruno Sovanya here in Ottawa. And I believe, Alessia, you had, you were involved in this Invisible Battalion project, at least in spirit, if not in actuality. 
you, so the question is, you mentioned uh, women playing a key role in the defense of Ukraine. I believe it's maybe up to 20% actually of Ukrainian soldiers are women. I've heard in previous uh, webinars, conferences, mentioning their role, not only at the front, but in the back, providing logistical support or handmade the gear. How important is the role in the war, in your opinion? Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's extremely important. I'll uh, start with, it's as important as in all wars. Um, when we talk about gender and war, we tend to think about something, you know, that is feminine about war. We, we accept the narrative about the war as that which happens in the trenches or that which has to do with missiles and tanks and so on. But wars are about societies. They affect every single person in society. And half of that society is uh, women. And also they are the ones that are likely to be in the most vulnerable position because they tend to look after dependents. We have this phrase, women and children. I am not a big fan of that phrase, um, but it's true that women, are, especially in countries which have general mobilization, like is the case in Ukraine at the moment, um, only some portion of women will be obliged to uh, join the armed forces. And, and there will be that portion. So medics, for instance, and women of other occupations who will also fall under that category that um, uh, is applied under general uh, mobilization. But most other women will end up looking after dependents. And that could be children, could be younger siblings, could be the elderly uh, parents and, and, and others. Um, so yeah, they're, they're usually in the most vulnerable position, they usually have the least protection, they tend to suffer from multiple levels of violence, so not only the immediate violence, but also violence connected, you know, if you become a refugee, you become subject to violence, and in terms of, I don't know, trafficking or gender-based violence in other ways, they're often the ones who become destitute really quickly. I'll now come back to the army. Uh, so yeah, there's over 20% uh, of uh, the army are women, the Ukrainian armed forces, and uh, the service women are about 13%. So there are civilian women as well as part of armed forces, but service women are about 13%. Uh, lots of women have joined territorial defense. I think it's 16,000 women who have received um, the status of war veterans, before, so over the last eight years before this uh, new phase of war. Uh, so it's quite a large group of people. They um, started to self-organize around this new invisible battalion movement. It was um, a film uh, at first, and um, uh, an advocacy campaign. Um, I, I'm sure you've, some of you have seen the film because I, I think it was screened in Canada uh, in different uh, cities. Um, but yeah, advocacy campaign that raised awareness about women's um, a precarious position in the armed forces at the front, uh, because until 2016, a lot of women joined uh, the army to fight in Donbass, but they were not allowed uh, to formally be registered for most of the occupations that they actually perform position positions that they actually were in. So for instance, women who were snipers or fighters, uh, were registered as administrators. And that uh, meant, because of the restrictive legislation in Ukraine and paternalistic restrictive legislation, the legacy of, of the Soviet Union. And that meant that they were in a, an extremely precarious position, a kind of semi-legal position at the front. And Invisible Battalion Advocacy Campaign managed to get that change, that legislation changed it, legalized those women who were at the front already. And it also created the path for other women to join the armed forces legally, should they wish to do so. Since then, they've already issued two other extremely useful um, uh, sociological studies one was on uh, reintegration of women veterans into civilian life, so raising awareness around PTSD um, and other issues. And another, the most recent, was about uh, sexual harassment in the armed forces. And imagine doing a study like that in a country that is fighting a war. It was really tough, but they did it and they achieved a lot of uh, results. Um, and they also created a very formidable uh, women veteran movement, which I try to follow as much as I can right now, um, which is still in existence. Unfortunately, I've lost the Q&A, so I, I can't ask the next question. 
Um, I'm going to get it back, but it's going to take a second. That's all right. So we have a question uh, from uh, Richard uh, Tarasovsky. Do you have any insights about what Russian popular opinion really is about Ukraine, given how much censorship and suppression of free speech is there? Is the Putin narrative truly dominant in Russia? Uh, I'm not going to share any uh, statistics with you because I, I don't have any handy. Maybe, Dominic, you do. Um, but I'll, I'll share again a, a personal story. Um, I have quite a lot of family in Russia, this more distant family. Um, it's on my mother's side. And when my brother was killed, uh, I mean, they tried to stay in touch. They've tried to stay in touch, at least with my mom. But when my brother was killed, um, one of the last conversations she had with a part of that family uh, was about the war in Ukraine. And she was trying to explain something to them. And they responded and said, look, we know what is happening in Ukraine. We watch TV. And that was the end of that conversation and actually the end of her communication with them. They never reached out again. It's quite telling, um, I think. I think some of it comes out of fear. So again, we make a choice whether we want to stay ignorant or not. Some of them are, I think, truly brainwashed by the messages they hear constantly on TV. Um, some of them choose to accept those messages because they fear to think otherwise. Um, I would be, do you know what? I was quite surprised by the reaction uh, that I saw in the media to the recent protest on uh, the TV channel in Russia. Um, it dominated all headlines. Uh, one, an act of one woman uh, who actually spent a long time working for that channel and was part of that machine uh, dominated the headlines for at least a day. And to me, it felt like, well, it's, it's an exception that proves the rule in the best case scenario. <laughs> Maybe I'll stop there. I, this is the moment when I would potentially say more, but I have to understand that a lot of my thoughts have not been processed about this. But I think the personal story is very telling because there have been reports of even daughters talking to their moms in, in Russia. And, and the mom, well, the mom saying, well, the daughter saying, you know, mom, they're bombing us in Kharkiv. No, they're not. Come on, mom, they're bombing us. I am in Kharkiv. There's something deep here going on. Um, in the meantime, Anastasia, did you get the Q&A back? The Q &A. I'll ask the next question because unfortunately it'll be my last uh, due to, uh, um, I feel it's my duty, unfortunately, not to turn down these invitations for, uh, you know, because that's our little contribution to try to go in the public discourse and. Uh, try to explain what's happening in, in Ukraine. So we have a question from our, our doctoral student here, the Chair of Ukraine Studies, Alexandra Wishart. Dear Alessia, how do you view the role and impact of cultural institutions and artists in the mobilization, aid and awareness on Ukraine? I have observed that cultural institutions have always been very explicitly political in Kiev, after Maidan in particular. She gives example, VCRC, Isolatia. What role do you see them play now during the war? That's a great question. Thank you so much for that. We, as at the Institute, we've been um, in touch with a lot of these institutions working really closely together and actually started such an exciting project together called Ukraine Lab. We were just, we're just receiving applications now. It's, uh, it's meant to connect Ukrainian-based writers and um, uh, UK writers uh, to write pieces together in conversation with each other about global issues such as hybrid warfare, disinformation, and um, environment, climate change, and so on. Um, don't know what's going to happen to that um, project now, but I think their role is um, huge. Uh, I think the fact that there was at least some awareness or some seeds planted about Ukraine, its heritage, its culture, uh, its literature, um, 
was thanks to the creation of those institutions after 2014 and their dedication, the dedication of their staff. And the fact that they were so keen on developing institutions, it wasn't about the careers of those individuals who were in charge of those institutions. It was really truly trying to create institutional memory, institutions that will outlive the leaders and you know will stand firmly on, on, uh, on their own feet. Um, moving forward. And now, I mean, they're still trying to function, at least some of them. I know they've suspended their projects. Um, they, they do their best. We see, we see them, they're visible, they're, we can hear them. Um, I'm talking specifically about Ukrainian Institute, the Cave Ukrainian Institute, State Ukrainian Institute. I, um, I'm in touch with them a lot. Um, but um, they never were very particularly well financed until now and i really can't imagine where they're going to get financing in the future when all ukrainian efforts will go into rebuilding you know infrastructure people's lives and so on so again i would urge all cultural institutions all over the world to understand that there are these institutions in ukraine that need support and this is also an opportunity for us here to start building bridges with them uh, to support them now, to support them in the future, to create collaborative projects, to not let that amazing flourishing of uh, cultural diplomacy, of, uh, of Ukrainian institutionalized culture uh, to be destroyed by this war. And Dominique, thank you so much for being well, here. Thank you. I need to sign off, but there's a tremendous amount of questions now in the Q&A. Uh, so Anastasia, it's on you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dominique. Bye. All right. Yes, we won't be able to make it through all the questions, but uh, um, since we were talking um, about cultural aspects, I, as our next question, uh, we have a question from Volodymyr. Rebinjak, um, do you know whether any steps have been taken to keep Ukrainian archival documents and cultural artifacts out of Russian hands? Uh, as far as I can see, uh, a lot of effort is being made to preserve whatever can be preserved, um, especially when it comes to museums, to um, uh, galleries, to other artifacts that can be preserved. Um, we, I'm sure you already know that certain museums have already been destroyed. Maria Primachenko is one of those examples. Um, but also, sadly, I think an awful lot of Ukrainian archives have not been digitized. Um, they still, you know, the documents are still in paper form. Uh, and I heard from a colleague that I think Chernihiv archive um, was already at least partly destroyed um, and we can expect sadly we can expect more of that to happen and it's not something that could be um, preserved very quickly I know a lot of effort is is going into uh, that preservation but it is something that breaks my heart and is something that is important to bear in mind I was in touch with a young scholar she defended not that long ago from Kharkiv and she just got into safety. She's in Europe now. Uh, and she was saying, I think she was still very much in shock. And she was saying, do you know what breaks my heart? Not that I have only one suitcase with only uh, necessary things with me. It's the fact that my entire archive that I collected uh, for my PhD, and then she listed all these unique things that she managed to get hold of, is still in my flat. And I have no idea if uh, I'll ever... Uh, be able to access it again it'll, if it'll survive. So it's not only institutional um, heritage that we have to protect. So much of individual archives are very likely to be lost. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Sue McMullen. Is there a difference in how the older and younger generations are reacting to the war? Is this in Ukraine or? Uh, uh, well, she doesn't specify, but um, I think maybe given how, how we've talked about, you know, the history and, and so on, I, I would, I'll let you interpret the question, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, it's again, it's at this point, I think we can only talk about sort of fragmented knowledge, right? So what we see in front of us and what we see in front of us, uh, young people en masse joining some kind of uh, F war effort, whether that's territorial defense and sadly having to take up arms, uh, or as I mentioned in my talk, teenagers rather than being in school are learning how to make Molotov cocktails. Uh, we also see examples like the woman who I think was older, who approached a, a completely unarmed woman who approached a fully armed Russian soldier and handed um, sunflower seeds to him um, with, you know, this very powerful speech that she made. She said, put them in your pocket so that sunflowers can grow out of your body when it's in the Ukrainian soil. Um, and we see older men standing completely unarmed in front of tanks. And in besieged cities, we see everybody, people, you know, parents with children, uh, older people going to protests in front of armed Russian troops and tanks with nothing but Ukrainian flags and standing together, all of these generations standing together and protesting. Um, I haven't seen any generational difference so far. And here as well, I mean, if we talk about sort of generations also of diaspora, let's face it, I, I would like to hear from the Canadians what it's like in Canada. Uh, but, you know, there have been tensions between different waves of diaspora. Um, but these tensions more or less disappeared in 2014, and I don't really see them now at all. We've all come together. We all work as one. We all know our strengths uh, and, and use them and help each other be as effective as possible in this collective uh, effort to help Ukraine fight this war um, and achieve victory as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, going back to the more sort of... Um, uh, I guess, state level questions. Uh, we have a question from uh, Trevor Norkit. To what extent might Putin's invasion have been inspired by the successful crushing of dissent in Belarus in 2020 and 2021, and the fear that a democratic Western oriented Ukraine may serve as inspiration for future dissent, both in Belarus and in an increasingly undemocratic Russia in, in the future? Thank you for that question. Well, I, I have no doubt that his response in 2014 was a, a direct reaction to um, what he was watching unfold on the Maidan. You know, the fact that uh, ordinary people, I mean, he calls it a coup. We all know that it's uh, yet another lie. Ordinary people paid a very high price to make sure that their voices are heard and that they reclaim their agency, that they do not, that they will not allow the country to become um, an authoritarian state like Russia or a police state like Russia. Lots of peaceful civilians died. It's a, a truly harrowing price to pay for having, uh, having your voice heard. But it is something I think that gave Ukrainians the courage to understand that they will continue doing this. They will not allow um, repression, uh, abuse of power on that level in Ukraine. Um, and the fact that we've had democratic, uh, free and democratic elections since twice already is on the evidence of that. And I'm sure uh, all of this um, is extremely threatening to Putin's regime. So we can, you know, we can talk about his new imperialist ambitions. We can talk about his uh, odd vision of history. Uh, we can talk about the kind of mythology that he tries to create for great Russia and so on. But let's remember that a democracy on his doorstep is the largest threat to his regime, to his power and to his wealth. Uh, and the fact that he was prepared to go to such lengths to destroy that democracy is telling that um, it threatens him directly, um, for sure. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions that um, touch on, um, they're, they're formulated differently, but um, so anyway, I'm point being that I think that this, this following question will answer several of the other questions that people have asked. Um, there are a, a lot of questions about um, what you were just referring to, um, Putin's, um, well, not so much his motiv motivations, but uh, his personal um, the you know, effects for him and so on. Um, so um, a question from um, Michael Torrey, are we seeing here the final attempt of the old Soviet Union to recover what was lost in 1990, 1991, and that when this reckless and unconscionable gamble surely fails, we will finally see the true end of the Cold War and the eventual democratization of Russia? Or is the Tsarist impulse so deep this will never happen? And I'll just add that we have also several questions about um, Russian propaganda and whether, whether you think that uh, there's any way of countering that. No easy questions tonight. The only way to counter Russian propaganda is to keep revealing the true state of affairs. And I think we are doing that. And it's really important that so much reporting happens on the ground now in Ukraine, uh, Western reporting. Um, it wasn't the case at the, at the start of this war in 2014. I saw a lot of reports on Maidan and then also on uh, Don Donbass from Moscow, not from Kyiv. It's only later that... Uh, major media companies started to realize that they actually have to be in Ukraine in order to report on Ukraine. And now it's different as we know. Michael, thank you for your question. Oh, hello, Michael. <laughs> thank you for joining. I saw Michael yesterday. Um, uh, is this the, the last attempt to restore the USSR? Um, well, Putin said that the biggest tragedy uh, of the 20th century is um, the collapse of the USSR, which is actually very interesting because he doesn't talk about the Second World War as the biggest tragedy, something that he likes to talk about. Um, and not even, uh, he doesn't talk about the Holocaust as the greatest tragedy, but he talks about the collapse of the USSR as the greatest tragedy. Um, is this an attempt to restore the USSR? Again, I don't think so. I mean, I genuinely think that this is an attempt for him and his cronies to keep power, to keep hold of power, to not allow their um, influence, their wealth uh, to uh, collapse. Um, and I think all of this sort of um, delusion of grandeur is just part of that. Um, when Putin's regime falls, and I'm sure it will, and probably sooner rather than later. Will this help democratization of Russia? Uh, I'd like to hope so, but it's up to the Russians. It's up to the citizens of that country whether they uh, find the courage, uh, like Ukrainians found in 2014 uh, and before that many times. That wasn't the first protest, obviously. It just was you know, the most recent and the one that changed a lot. You know, whether they will choose a different future. They, their leaders have encouraged them to be stuck in the past for so long, and not even the past, but a very distorted version of the past, that they, I think, forgot to think that there is a way to think about the future. And I think what makes you, if I, if I have to answer the question, what makes Ukrainians and what is different between Ukrainians and Russians, I think it's the fact that Ukrainians have a very clear vision of the future of the country in which they want to live and the future that they've been building uh, daily since uh, the uh, Maidan revolution. And that's they, why they're prepared to fight for it and uh, not let anybody take it away from them. Thank you. Uh, we now have a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, what is according to you, the most important misconception or misperception of Ukrainian history in the, in the West? And what do you think is the best approach to making Ukrainian and Eastern European voices, perspectives, histories visible and heard in the Western academic and public discussions? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Actually, um, thanks for making me think about it. The immediate thought, and maybe maybe tomorrow I'll think of something else, and the list is very long to choose from, but the immediate thought, I think, is that it's a small country. 
Ukraine is a small country. Um, it's small next to Russia, most countries will be. But uh, over the last few months, I saw a lot of initiatives of taking the outline of Ukraine on the map of Ukraine and placing it, superimposing it on Europe or superimposing it on um, the states and showing just how absolutely enormous it is. I mean, it is the largest, the largest country in Europe. Um, and I think a lot of that idea that it's a small country uh, uh, is then responsible for all the other ways we think about Ukraine, that somehow its literature is minor, that somehow its culture is secondary to great Russian culture, that somehow its language is just a subcategory of the Russian language and so on. So I think this, uh, I think Rory Finnan called it reversed hallucination. Uh, so not seeing what is actually in front of you. So this idea of not seeing Ukraine that is so large, that is so diverse, that is so versatile um, is probably the biggest uh, misunderstanding of that country. And now we've seen it. So I'd like to hope that there's, that there's hope in us managing to correct those uh, misconceptions. Thank you. Um, so um, going again into the more political uh, question from uh, Michael Jules, will the sanctions against the oligarchs be effective? Are, the, are not the Siloviki the major support for Putin? How possible is regime change in Moscow? And again, the same trends coming back in several questions. But, uh, I wish I could answer those questions. I wish I was qualified to answer those questions. Uh, journalists keep asking me very similar questions here as well. And I try to refer them to experts who understand how sanctions work and can comment with some um, authority on that. Um, the one thing I could say here is I think uh, we haven't sanctioned all the uh, people who have not just been uh, you know, who have not just had crucial connections with the Kremlin and therefore um, uh, supported this war in direct or indirect ways, but who have also had profound impact on our societies in the West. I'm specifically talking about London. Um, I mean, it has this nickname London Grad for a reason. Um, I think there's still a lot of... Uh, influence, Russian influence, whether that's financial or um, through connections on the politics here, on the political scene here. And I'm trying to explain to uh, my non-Ukrainian colleagues all over the world that it's in our interest all over the world to break that uh, influence, to get rid of it for good, because it affects our political life here. Uh, not just in Ukraine. So I think there's much more that needs to be done. Whether that leads to uh, the change of regime in Russia, I don't know, but uh, I think the change of regime in Russia is inevitable. Uh, thank you. Um so many questions. It's it's. It, uh, I'm I'm so impressed by all these people who've been monitor. Sorry, monitoring and moderating at the same time. And now I understand what a challenge it is. Um, thank you for doing it. Uh, oh, oh no, I'd only I, be able to read the questions too. But you make my life so much easier. <laughs> oh well, it's it's absolutely uh, my my pleasure. Um, so well, moving on from what you just said about how you think there has to be regime change. Um, so do you, uh, from uh, Donald Orth, do you think that Ukraine-Russian relations can normalize after the demise of Putin? Or is this something inherent in the Russian mentality? Um, in other words, is this conflict basically a Putin-motivated action or one that would have occurred regardless? Uh, I feel like I sort of partly answered that question. I think that was the first question that I tried to answer at the beginning, and and maybe maybe the um, 
the guest uh, missed that bit. Um, but I, I mean, so there's two things that I raised already, and that's the Russian society has to think of its complicity um, on a much larger scale. You don't have to be complicit if you just, uh, you know, the, the it's not the, not the only way to be complicit is by participating actively in 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 aggression by not doing anything to stop this aggression is also a degree of complicity. So that's for them to reflect on. Um, and I did say right at the start, I think in the first answering the first question is that I do not think we can expect Ukrainians to even begin to consider any kind of reconciliation until justice is done. And until we see that justice and it, and it is in full until reparations are paid to Ukraine for all the damage that is caused and until those grieving families that are growing in numbers daily every hour in Ukraine um, can see that at least uh, you know at least these war criminals are punished um, yeah and I think it's a it's the time for the Russian society to really think what it's done until now and what it wants to do in the future and how they can uh, they what they can do to rebuild um, some kind of relationship with Ukrainians. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Konstantin Hutan. Uh, can you comment on the so-called realist history school represented by scholars like John Mearsheimer mm -hmm. of the University of Chicago? that sets a moral equivalency among the great powers and in the current situation, blames the West as responsible for the current crisis for having ostensibly intruded upon Russian, Russia's quote, historical and security interests and peeled away, uh, peeled Ukraine away from the sphere and irresponsibly rushed to expand NATO in the 90s. That's certainly a discourse that's been going around a lot lately. And I'm sure you have, I'm sure you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm not going to comment on uh, any specific names um, and their positions. I don't think this is the place to do so. Uh, on NATO, I'm sure this has been repeated thousands of times. There was no uh, real desire to join NATO in Ukraine until Putin attacked. Uh, we have to remember that. that uh, people started to consider joining NATO as an option only after 2014 for obvious reasons because because they felt like they need to be um, protected by a larger structure uh, you know against such a enormous army and a ruler that uh, wants to destroy statehood and now as we can see actually wants to destroy not just Ukrainian statehood but is actively destroying the entire population uh, or wishes to to see it destroyed doesn't stop before anything at all um, in terms of uh, this kind of rhetoric that it's the west to blame or it's NATO expansionism I, I, I will give a very brief answer those people who uh, push that line of argument need to think where is Ukraine in their argument? Have they given Ukraine agency? Because those arguments tend to be the ones that simply deny Ukrainian subjectivity. Um, suggesting that somehow it's the fault of the West or of provoking Putin or, you know, um, not taking into account uh, Putin's security uh, concerns they forget that we're talking about another sovereign state that also has security concerns, as we can see now, that makes its own choices. Right, a question from Yulia Ivanyuk. Um, according to some sources, Ukraine is considering neutrality as part of the ceasefire talks. What do you think of that? Is this a viable option for Ukraine? Uh, I think we need to listen to uh, the people of Ukraine and uh, the president of Ukraine at the moment, who's really, you know, who's facing up this uh, absolutely enormous challenge very bravely and has the people's support and how much has already been sacrificed in order to defend Ukraine's statehood. Um, 
And I think we have to be very careful when any sort of suggestions of neutrality or other demands coming out of Russia towards Ukraine are being voiced because their primary um, aim might not be ceasefire. Uh, it might be division in Europe and the West. To divide the allies that have been so strongly supporting Ukraine in a very united manner, something that I'm sure Putin was very surprised to see because I think he was relying on the divisions in the West uh, to play their part, um, to, to plant the seed of division, to divide them into those powers who will pressurize Ukrainian government to accept these unreasonable uh, demands and into those who, who will not. So really it's, um, I think we need to be very careful when we discuss these, uh, these demands. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we uh, have a question from uh, Igor Andrichuk. Uh, since the lecture is in the memory of Ivan Franco, what would be his or his generation's response to the ongoing war? Or uh, to put it more generally, um, how similar or dissimilar is the current war in Ukraine with earlier wars on its territory? <laughs> um... What a wonderful question. I wish we could uh, get some Franco scholars here to answer that question much better. Uh, I mean, with, in terms of parallels with other wars, uh, I usually try not to draw parallels with other wars because uh, as a historian, I think it's very important for us. I mean, we can learn from parallels something, but it's important to see conflicts in the context in which they unfold. Um, Parallels sometimes make us a little, I think, immune to, to the nuance of the, the conflict in front of our eyes. But the one parallel that I is, that does uh, strike me when I think about it is that, you know, after the First World War, Ukrainian interests, the interests of Ukrainian nation that wanted to become a state were not taken into, into consideration by those who were creating uh, recreating peace in Europe. After the Second World War, uh, Stalin was able to maintain all the territory that he acquired essentially um, in Malta Ribbentrop Pact and uh, as a result of post-war settlement. Again, Ukrainian considerations were not taken into account. Um, and I'd really like to hope that we've learned our lessons, if there are lessons to, learn, to be learned from history um, today, um, and that it's going to be Ukrainian, um, it's going to be Ukrainian uh, agency and subjectivity and statehood that's going to be um, at the, uh, you know, front of um, all decision-making uh, among the allies to, uh, that they make in relation to how to best support Ukraine now. In terms of uh, Ivan Franco and other figures, I mean, it doesn't just have to be uh, Franco, but also Lesya Ukrainka and others who wrote um, truly revolutionary uh, poetry and, and history, and of course, the Rashevchenko too. Um, they understood Russia's imperialism very well. Uh, they understood the power of Ukrainian identity and desire for unity. Um, and I think now is a real time for us to reread them, uh, reread them afresh, to retranslate them, and that is happening already, um, and to introduce them to the wider world as well. Um, again, in this attempt, bel belated, the delayed attempt of uh, showing that Ukrainian uh, culture has its own tradition, has its own canon and it is part of uh, European culture and world culture. Thank you very much. We're getting quite short on time at this point. So I'm gonna ask just kind of a question to, to wrap it up. Um, you've talked a lot about you know, the misconceptions or just just lack of information, uh, lack of knowledge that uh, people have about Ukraine um, and the history and, and, and so on. 
Um, what in 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 a few in a few sentences, a paragraph, what um, what would you like us? I, I'm 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 assuming a, a large part of our audience is is Canadian. Um, what what would you like us to know? And and um, sort of moving forward in the current uh, climate. To know about Ukraine. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, and uh, or what, uh, or and maybe since you did sort of address that before with you know the the greatest misinformation, but what um, maybe even is there one is there one piece of um, Ukrainian culture that we should all be familiar with, uh, whether it's a classic Ukrainian film or a book about the history of Ukraine. Um, you know, what can we, what can we do as, um, as Canadians to get uh, better informed and, um, and also, you know, to create these, these connections? Thank you. That's a very complex question. Um... I think actually Canadians know Ukraine very well because you have such an enormous Ukrainian community and it's a very active and vocal Ukrainian community. Um, so I think you're doing well all right, uh, already. Um, read Ukrainian, read war literature uh, that's appeared from 2014 um, already. Um, it, a lot of it is already translated um, in English. It's available in English, or if you can read in the original, read it in the original. There's some really exciting uh, books. I mean, I've uh, th there's so many. I hesitate to list some of the names, so I I'll just list the ones that I uh, really like, and that's um, Olena Stashkina. It's um, uh, um, Andrei Kurkov, especially his Grey Bees that he wrote about the Grey Zone. Um, I'm sure I'm going to forget some. Sergei Zhadan, um, Irina Shovalova's poetry, um, Artem Chekh, uh, Natalia Vorozhbyt's um, Bad Roads, and she also turned her play into a film, so watch it if you can. There's very um, powerful films coming out about the war as well. Um, at the Atlantis by Vasinovich, many others, some excellent documentaries by Irina Tsilik, um and others. I because I'm put on the spot, I don't have a list in front of me, and I hesitate not to offend anybody who, whose work I adore by not mentioning them. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a great uh, variety of fantastic, uh, very good quality material to familiarize yourself with this war that's already been destroying Ukraine for so long through the eyes of Ukrainians who have experienced it. And I would be very happy to send my recommendations if, if you want to get in touch with me. But one thing, if there's one thing I'd like to encourage all of us really outside of Ukraine uh, to think about is this question. We're so fascinated by the way the Ukrainians came together uh, to defend their country, to defend their statehood. We admire them so much. Um, I truly believe that it is because they have this vision of what country they want to live in. And I think it's going to do us all a lot of good if we sit down and think, do we have a vision of our respective countries, regions, and the world that we want to live in? And are we prepared to defend it each in our own way that is available to us? Oh, thank you. I think, I think a lot of us have been thinking a lot about that question uh, in the last uh, three weeks. Um, so all, all good things uh, have to come to an end. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Alessia, for this uh, wonderful talk and for adding uh, some very difficult questions and quite a range of questions as well. Um, uh, so on behalf of the uh, Chair of Ukrainian Studies of the University of Ottawa and the UK, Ukrainian Canadian Professional and Business Association Ottawa chapter, I want to thank uh, everyone very much for attending the 36th annual Ivan Franco lecture. Um, and uh, once again, uh, as Dominique said earlier, you'd be getting a big round of applause. Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Alessia, and, uh, good, uh, and a good evening uh, to everyone. <laughs>
thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure to, to ad ad address this absolutely amazing audience. And thank you so much for your questions. Uh, please do get in touch. Um, I'm struggling to answer my emails at the moment, but I will get through them at some point and I, I will respond to all the questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you.